don't tell anyone, I managed to get past security. That is a good start for me. Uh, so where to start with my journey? Um, I'm actually only going to start a couple of days ago. I was, uh, I was walking up the moor in Sheffield, one of the major high streets, and um, there was one of those guys with a clipboard. I was like, oh, no, no, don't target me. And then he, he came towards me with this clipboard, and he's like, oh, do you like tigers? I'm like, oh, no, he's from a wildlife place. And he's like, oh, well, you need to help me save the tigers. Um, what's £1.80 to you? What's £1.80 to you? And I was like, well, actually, £1.80, right? Well, I was excluded from school when I was 14. I left home when I was 16. I was homeless for two years. I regained my education through Norton College through an inspiring tutor who unfortunately lost his life but put everything into me, taught me about the Maslow hierarchy of needs, base level needs being shelter and food. He bought me a £1.80 sandwich that actually inspired me to come to college and actually save my future. I now save the future of other young people via £1.80 sandwiches that inspires them to come to college, and that's the future. Um, but I like tigers. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk to you about NEAT engagement. Um, NEAT being not in employment, education or training. Now you might be sat there thinking, oh, I don't really, don't really know about NEAT, it doesn't really bother me. Um, but I tell you, it impacts every one of the people in this room. Um, NEATs are everywhere, you know, it might be that you drive past them when you're on your way to work, you know, they're on a street corner in school time. It might be that a friend of a friend has a child that is not engaged in education. It might be that you're a teacher in a class of 30 young people, one of them um, being one of these young people. Um, NEATs affect everybody. Um, and I think it's important at this stage to say that not any young person chooses to be neat. It's not a choice. You don't wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to be neat today. That's me. Um, it, is, it is due to circumstances. Um, so going back to my own exclusion from school, age 14, um, it's an unbelievably isolating time being isolated from school. And I remember being at the end of the gate, watching all my friends go in and uh, not being able to enter the doors. And uh, luckily for me, I had a little dog, and, uh, and his name was Maxwell. And your minds are working now, thinking, Sophie Maxwell, Maxwell, dog. <laughs> um, yep, um, I didn't name my dog after me, I named myself after my dog. Um, because my dog was one of the first mentors I had in my life, and really taught me how to network. Uh, I was out in the parks, <laughs> chatting to all the people in the parks, and uh, that was thanks to Maxwell. Um, when I was 16, I was made homeless um, through a women's refuge centre. And um, I had my own property, a supported house, a supported flat. And, um, and there was two people that lived next door to me, a couple, who ended up um, moving into my flat. At 16 years old, I had no idea how to look after myself in this flat and what I was supposed to be doing. And unfortunately, you know, I went down the path of drugs. Um, three months later, um, the young man that moved in with me, who was quite a bit older than me, actually lost his life. And this was a very defining point uh, in my own life. I, um, the kids down my college have bet me I won't do this, and so I'm going to make sure that I do it. Um, so here we go. Excuses, I got beat the track, no feel the juices, misuse bruises, I'm losing it. No, my eyes dilated, you're choosing it. Third row, my friend's cremation, wasn't right, no explanation. Testified, looked his mum and dad face on, eyes to eyes, and told him I was sorry for this son's life. 24 years old, too young to die, they said, look to the hope, at least you survived, but I can't move on, I can't see through these eyes. I feel re responsible, it breaks me inside. Um, so they convinced me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, it leads me into how we teach and how we engage young people. Um, I came in, uh, in today and uh, one of the um, presenters here kind of looked at me and went, uh, are you brought up with business suit? I'm like, mm, no. Um, <laughs> so um, obviously you have to be relevant. These young people to engage in you, they have to see the relevance of who you are as a person. Uh, one principle that I invented down my college came one day when someone asked me, why are you Sophie? Why can you engage? What is it about you that, that makes you engage these young people? And I really sort of had to think about it. And we came up with the principle of matching and pacing. Uh, matching being the young people see something in you that they recognise in themselves and being able to relate to that. Pacing being the fact that we've lived through it and as a tutor or a mentor, we've come through the other side and we're now living a life that possibly is a little bit inspiring. We've chosen to change our lives around and they see that they could be that person, they could reach that point in their lives where they, them too, have changed their own lives. 
Um, so, how did I get back into education? Well, age 17, I'd just witnessed the death of my friend. I walked into Norton College in Sheffield and sort of said, oh, teach me, I want to learn. I've got no GCSEs, but I will, I swear down, I'll learn. And uh, they were like, well, I'm really sorry, you know, you've... Uh, got no GCSEs, you know, you're going to have to start at the bottom. And I thought, oh, sod this, I'm out of here. And started walking out the college. And this guy sort of grabbed me by the collar and he's like, oh, hang on, hang on. You know, you look pretty fit. You know, what do you do? do you, are you into sport? I was like, well, actually, you know, I'm an athlete for the city. You know, and athletics was the one thing that actually, you know, saved me. It was, you know, it was my passion. It became my purpose. And then it became my career. Um, this tutor, he'd, uh, he grabbed me by the collar and he said, come on, come and do a sport and leisure course with me. And his name was Paul Cassum. He used to pick me up from the hostels I was living in and he used to take me to the boxing ring and his daughter would basically beat the crap out of me. <laughs> she was a bit, a bit harder than I was, but, you know, uh, and I was in the ring with Paul one day and he sort of said to me, listen, Sophie, you know, you can, uh, you can beat the crap out of my face, just watch my stomach. I was like, oh, what do you mean, Paul? And he actually explained to me he had stomach cancer, quite an aggressive form. And uh, unfortunately, Paul lost his life before I graduated at Norton College. But it was that one person who believed in me who said, Sophie, you can make it to university. And that, for me, was a defining point in my life where I thought, do you know what? I think I can. And I did. I went on to university, Sheffield Hallam in Sheffield, and, uh, and I graduated in 2009. But that, for me, wasn't enough. I had to give back at this point. People had inputted into my life, and it was time to give back. Um, so, I basically, <laughs> I decided to do 250 voluntary hours for a local primary school. Um, my coach at the time down Don Valley Stadium was like, well, right, Sophie, I've got a really simple thing for you to do. Pick 20 kids up, take them on a tram, get them to Don Valley Stadium, and get them back again. I was like, I can do that, that's easy. <laughs> um, and then I sort of turned up, and these were wild, wild. <laughs> they were hanging off my arms, they were on my shoulders, you know, they were everywhere. Got them on the tram, and I cannot tell you the number of times they pressed the emergency stop button <laughs> on the tram. Um, so I got my first taster of working with some young people that were a bit, you know, out of the box. Um, so after that, I decided to set my own business up, AW Education. Um, and I've since run 26 projects across South Yorkshire, from environmentally friendly fashion shows that are intergenerational, you know, where elderly people had their hoods up and spray painted the town hall. They whipped their hoods down and everyone's like, <gasps> because they were elderly. Um, and, you know, done, done pretty much everything you can think of. Um, but my very first project was at a local secondary school called Chaucer in a disadvantaged area of Southie Green. And I went into Chaucer and uh, I said, listen, can I do some secondary school athletics? They heard my story and they said, Sophie, no, nope, what you're going to do is teach maths and English GCSE. <laughs> maths and English GCSE? I still don't have a maths and English GCSE. <laughs> and, uh, and these are eight excluded students. And through some madness, I took on the project. And through the next five months, you know, I didn't sleep, um, but I got these, five, uh, these eight young people through their GCSEs. Um, and I remember one of the lessons very well. Um, I looked at the syllabus. It was Pythagoras. I thought, what the hell is that? Um, I researched it the night before. I took the young people out onto a field with a bit of string and a calculator and taught Pythagoras on a field. Um, then bits of string flew everywhere and one hit me in the head and the deputy head teacher saw it and it went great. But we taught Pythagoras in a field and it was outside of the box and they were engaged. Um, and that was where all the passion came from. Um, I then remember being at a networking event, it was Christmas 2010, and I was in front of a crowd like you guys, and I remember having this conversation with myself and a little bit of an argument in front of everyone, sort of saying, well, I've done all these projects, they're fantastic, but then 16 weeks is up, and then the young person, what am I going to do with them next? Oh my gosh, um, I'm going to have to set up a college, I'm going to have to, that's it, a college, I'm going to set my own college up. And sure enough, uh, it was March 2011, that's exactly what I did. I got my own warehouse, I got a couple of excluded students, and I took them to this premises, and I started teaching them with the matching and pacing methodology. 
Um, one of the most important things for NEETs is the way we recruit. And this is so, so missed out on in councils when they, they're recruiting NEETs. It's, you know, outreach to these houses is one of the most important things you can do. You know, it's that first point of contact to finding this young person. And what is the reason of this engagement? You know, every young person is different. I never come across a young person that has the same circumstances as another young person. So it's about reacting in the moment and seeing them as an individual and then using the matching and pacing methodology. So it's, uh, I got to the point in my life where I had a, a college full of young people and no funding to keep the college going. So I had to do something about it. And I'd seen Emma Harrison from Action for Employment and I sort of saw what she was doing, £150 million business, and I thought, wow, cool. Um, that's kind of what I do, but on big scale. Um, so I'd, um, I'd heard something a long time ago about the six degrees of separation. And uh, the six degrees of separation is you are six people from anywhere, anyone in the world. Wow. So um, I thought, well, Emma Harrison, six people away. Great, fantastic. 0800 number, Action for Employment, Sheffield. Hello, <laughs> I'm Sophie Maxwell. I'm working with NEETS in Sheffield. Um, yes, if you want to be a partner to Action for Employment, please complete the application form online. Uh, started the application form, ADHD, two seconds, gone. Can't do it. Um, phone them back up again. Okay, I've tried the application form. Um, can you pass me through to somebody else? And they passed me through to the charities department in Action for Employment. And they were like, wow, sounds brilliant. Here's Emma Harrison's PA. Why don't you phone her? And gave me her number. So I phoned her up and I was like, wow, Sophie Maxwell, this is what I'm doing. And she was like, great, Emma will love it. And she sent Emma an email. And on that email, she thought, oh, Sophie Maxwell, Sheffield doing this, doing that. And Emma sent her an email back and accidentally copied me in. <laughs> and put, what can I do? So I thought, hmm, what can Emma do? And sent her an email back again, what Emma could do. Um, <laughs> And heard nothing, nothing. Um, so uh, then I got in touch with David Blunkett, one of our local councillors, and, and I told David about my passion, and David said, do you know what? You're like a young Emma Harrison. <laughs> I'll get you a meeting. And sure enough, I got my meeting with Emma Harrison. Um, didn't go that well, actually. <laughs> um, but the very next day, after having a devastating night thinking, oh, it's just not gone well, I thought, do you know what? I really need to change my methodology here. You know, two grand here or there is not going to do this. You know, I've got responsibility to these young people to keep this college going. And I walked into Sheffield College um, and I spoke to their management staff and said, listen, there's gaps in Sheffield College. I think I can fill them. And they were like, great, do it. So, oh, I wasn't expecting you to say yes. Um, <laughs> and sure enough, we've just signed into a contract with Sheffield College to be able to deliver to NEETs across um, Sheffield, and I'm hoping to change as many of their lives as possible. Um, so I just finished you today with saying, you know, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Thank you. Thank you.